and said that he is the perfect man to represent the voice of his community. Some even consider him to be the most genuine, laid-back candidate to uphold his position and political office. On this episode of Beyond Revealed Talk Show, Carletta McMillan travels to Tallahassee, Florida to discuss family influence, community ties, and politics with Senator Christopher L. Smith. While visiting the state capitol, she also had the privilege of speaking with Representative Bobby DeBose and Attorney Benjamin Crump. Stay tuned for this exclusive interview here on Beyond Revealed. Um, well, for one, I know that you know, you're very down to earth. Um, and a lot of people know you as the politician, as the lawyer, as the, the father, as the husband, as the son, the cousin, nephew. Like you have so many names. Who is Chris Smith? Uh, just a lucky boy. Very lucky to be where I am and have a, I have a good life. And I, I, I'm a person that enjoy life and enjoy where I am in life right now. Let's start from little Chris Smith. Oh, they was going to call you Fern, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell me about the name uh, change. I have an aunt Gladys who had... Um, a son that she wanted to name Christopher, but it was a hard birth. Um, so she couldn't think of the name Christopher. She named him Charles. And so she always wanted a Christopher. Well, years later, my mom had me. And for some God only knows reason, she named me Fern LaVon Smith. And that's the name she told the nurse to put on the birth certificate, Fern LaVon Smith. I can't tell you how many beatings I would have gotten in school with that name. But luckily, Auntie Gladys, um, she found the nurse and said, oh, she changed her mind. She wanted it to be Christopher. So it became Christopher LaVon Smith, unbeknownst to my mom, who still thought her baby name was Fern. And she was asking for her baby name, Fern. And so my name is Christopher because of Auntie Gladys. Okay. Auntie Gladys. Good Auntie Gladys. <laughs> Um, and of course we're cousins, so I will be referring to a lot of these people as uncle and auntie, but, um, I also know in the process of your uh, childhood, you didn't have a father. How was that, you know, growing up for you? I want to know about the role models because you're a very upstanding guy now. So how was that growing up without a father and then turning out to be this great man that you are today? Well, it was, it was difficult, but I develop fathers in other ways. Um, not having a father in the house. I mean, I grew up playing Little League football and all the sports, and you want daddy there. And it was tough not having daddy there, not having daddy there to teach you how to shave, how to, you know, do man things. Uh, but luckily, I found a father in many different people in my life. Um, at different stages, there were different people, either, you know, friends of the family or even other family members that you know, became fathers to me. And uh, the one person I always think of is Mr. Haynes, who lived down the street from us. And he had two sons. Now, he was a single father with two sons. And he'd take them to football practice and stuff. And he'd take me with his own kids. Now, Mr. Haynes was a lawn man. I, I don't even know if he finished school. But he was a lawn man. And I just saw in him a man who was handling his business, taking his kids to, to practice every day, being a part of his kids, and then even taking me, being a, having me being a part of that. And so, yeah, I kind of leaned on him as a father. Right. Later on, there were different people from a city commissioner who got me into politics that I leaned on as a father and learned things from him while I was in high school. Um, a lawyer, um, Bob Hebner, who interesting is a white man <laughs> who I look up to as a father even to this day so i didn't have a father in the home and that was tough being young because you always want daddy around okay. but i was able to find fathers in many different people throughout the community and, and latch on to them and learn the things i needed to learn from them and thinking about um learning from people uh you will see you mentioned him in your book yeah. and the reason why i'm pointing out you will see because um one of the things you did mention that he gave opportunities to people that um, didn't necessarily have the educational background to be an entrepreneur. So he gave that through his lawn care. Seeing that, do you really believe, do you think back on those days? Definitely. Um, and you see, it's funny we, because, you know, in our community, if you're older than me, you're uncle. Right. He's actually my cousin. <laughs> but um, you see, has the lawn business. And every day he takes out these trucks to do lawns. And 
he has many people working on his trucks. I mean, pimps, prostitutes, thieves, everybody. But if they put on that burgundy shirt that says Universal Landscape and they get on that truck and they do a hard day's work, they get a decent day's pay. And it's so funny. Actually, he doesn't pay most of them. He has to pay their baby mama or their, <laughs> or their, their landlord or different places to make sure that they don't squander their money. But he gives everybody an opportunity. And that's what a lot of my political career has been about, giving people opportunity because everybody deserves a chance to work. Right. Everybody, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter how many times you've done in the past, if you want to work, you can work. And I think I, I may get that from, from dealing with Ulysses all these years and seeing the type of people he's hired and kept around and people come and go, but Ulysses has always given them an opportunity. Uh, it's, it, I was afraid during this interview that I might cry because when I'm, I got a sneak peek of your book that hopefully you'll be releasing sometime this year. It's a good read. Um, I think I texted you a couple of times to let you know I was like crying, but um, we went through the same thing and I had no idea. That's what touched me a lot. We uh, went same education, same uh, just different statuses in life. You went to Browder State? Browder State's elementary, Parkway Middle, Plantation <laughs> High School, Johnson C. Smith, Smith University. How were those different stages, if you can briefly touch on those, you know, because Broad Estates and Parkway were in the same neighborhood. And then I know you went to another school, Shamanad. And then Plantation High School. Well, Broad Estates and Parkway was great because it's in our community. Yeah. And I'd walk to school. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was a great experience every day. It was I'd walk two houses down and Jason Smith, no relation, but it was like my brother growing up. And then we'd walk around the corner, pick up Ellis, and then walk to school every day, all through elementary school, all through middle school. And that was great being in a neighborhood school because you, you, you met people from the neighborhood and, and that was my that was my crew. That was the kids that all lived in the same neighborhood. And those were schools in which actually my role models were African Americans because we had that's back when we had black teachers and black principals and Miss Hankerson was my first principal and Miss Hankerson lived next door to my Aunt Carolyn. Uh, and so it was great having my elementary school principal that lived in the neighborhood. That that's one thing I, I don't want to digress, but I miss that that we had our teachers, our principals, our educators lived in the communities in which they worked. And I think that was great because when I messed up in school, she'd tell my mom, she'd tell my auntie. Um, and so being at those schools and then going to Parkway Middle, there was Dean Pearson, who was the, the dean of boys. He lived down the street from Parkway. I played Little League with his sons. Um, dean Pearson was a, was a great role model. And just being in those community schools and being educated by people in the community, I think laid a great foundation. Now, I did mess up a lot in middle school, and so I was sent to Chaminade High School, which Parkway was community school, all black. Right. Chaminade was all white, all male, right. Catholic, college preparatory high school. I know you say you were like, what, the two or three? It was three black people in the school. Two of us named Chris. And so Chris, Chris, and Bubble. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that was a culture shock, to say the least, and going to mass every day in, uh, in school and dealing with just nothing but white people and dealing with nothing but boys. I mean, that was a culture shock tremendously. And I, I was there for two years. Um, wound up leaving there at the time. And I don't think, and I, I want to say this correctly, I don't think the kids at Chaminade were racist. They just weren't used to having african-americans in class with them and okay. being in the in their being in their circle right. and so there was a lot of insensitivity and after two years of me playing football and running track and you know being one of the guys after still hearing some of the comments and some of the stuff i wound up leaving there and going to yet my community school again which was plantation high school which our, our neighborhood went to and when i got to plantation i uh, fell right into place with a lot of my old friends uh, but it, it was a good network of people at Plantation, and it's funny, all of us from my little circle went off to college, because Plantation is a school that the neighborhood it drew from wasn't upper-class neighborhoods, you know, middle-class neighborhood, or lower middle-class, but still, all of us made it out of there and went to college. A lot of them went to FAMU, some went to Morehouse, Johnson C. Smith, Bethune Cookman, Clark Atlanta. We all went to college, and it was a great network, and I still you know, ran into those people and I still hang with most of them. I know one of them um, in particular um, is Bobby DeBose. He's now a representative here 
in um, the state of Florida. Chris and I growing up, um, we played, we fought, but more than anything, he's always been like a big brother. Right. Uh, so you know the plus and the negative that comes with having an older sibling. Uh, <laughs> so just being engaged and, and, and funny enough, uh, Chris was president of the NAACP Youth Council. Yes. And so I served on his administration and then when he graduated, went to uh, went off to college, Johnson C. Smith. Yes. Uh, I stepped up and I was the president of the Youth Council. Um, I didn't go to John C. Smith. I went to, uh, no, uh, <laughs> I went to the University of Florida, go Gators. <laughs> and while at UF, you know, the skills that I learned uh, growing up uh, in Fort Lauderdale Parkway, I was able to accomplish, uh, you know, big things there. I was vice president of student government, uh, Florida Blue Key. And to be honest, just being engaged and being involved just kind of speaks to who I am. I feel I'm a philanthropist at heart and always, you know, wanting to give back and help the next generation. Um, speaking about plantation, that was when you were a page coming to Tallahassee. I also had the opportunity from your mom, my aunt, um, Helen. Do you think that shaped your perspective on coming here in the, you know, as a career? No. Uh, coming here as a page was interesting because that was my first time being away from home. Yeah, I mean, I lived here for a week. Our page program, you come up here, live for a week, and you walk in the chambers and stuff. And I had no clue. And it's hard for me to remember some of the only thing I remember about being a page here was staying in some apartment with three other high school kids. And it was like, great, being away from home and everything. I remember walking the halls a little bit, but not as much. Um, but that... I, I never had a clue that I'd be back here as a member. So going to the the campaigning season, the politics, um, how did that all, how did that journey start for you? Well, I, I think it started when I was in high school. I was in the NAACP um, Youth Council, and I was, student, I was the president of the Youth Council. And that got me looking at you know, public policy and how it affects it at the time. The president of the adult branch was Carlton Moore, who was the city, who was a city commissioner at the time. And so I was the youth council president. He was an adult branch president. And so, you know, we worked together and I looked up to him and like, okay, public policy, being an elected official, doing those things. And my aspiration was to be a city commissioner. And after law school, I came back to Fort Lauderdale, got appointed to the planning and zoning board in Fort Lauderdale, which is a huge position, appointed position, because we determined what buildings can be built and stuff in the community. And so that was a high profile position. And my track was to go to city commissioner, be a city commissioner when Carlton leaves. And then some dominoes fell in Tallahassee. And I got a call one night saying, hey, um, Mandy Dawson, who was the state representative, is going to run for Senate and you're going to run for state rep. Um, You'll get a call tomorrow, and you're running for the state house. So I'd already been building, building for city commission, but I wound up running for state representative. And a Democrat at that. Yes. For years, you were a Republican. Yes. Now, how did that work out? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of that rebellion <laughs> in me. So while at John C. Smith, and I mean, kind of these kids are rebellious, and since everybody was Democrat, I was Republican. Um, and, I, and I did believe in some of the, the values that they espoused at the time. I, I, I do believe in an amount of personal responsibility. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conservative on a lot of issues, even social issues. I'm, I'm naturally pretty conservative. Um, but, of course, the Republican Party has just gone crazy. Um, and back when I finished college, I went ahead and uh, switched parties to Democrat. And that was way before I ran for office. But... Um, I, I still am, I would consider myself a, a pretty conservative Democrat representing a pretty liberal district. Now, is there a lot of, um, are there a lot of other people that change their, their views? No, most, I mean, most, it, it, it's funny in politics when people make, hey, oh, he used to think this way, not that, you know, that's growth. You change your views on everything. You don't think the same way you thought in high school that you think in college and that you think now. It's a natural progression for you to change your views on stuff. 
I remember in high school, certain music I thought was the greatest music ever. Now I listen to that music like, why are they cussing so much? <laughs> so, so, I mean, as you grow, you change. And and so politicians are, are naturally too. I mean, as you grow and you learn more, you should change. Anybody who has the same views they had back when they were 20, that they have that 30, that now they're a politician saying they have those same views, that means you haven't grown any as a person. So um, when, I, when I think about your campaigning days um, and you heard the, the statement, it takes a village to raise a child, what comes to mind if I say it takes a family to win a campaign? It, it reminds me that campaigns can get lonely. Um, I, was, I was recruited by the campaign, by the political establishment to run for the House, but people could talk you into running, but when it comes down to running, it's you and your family. It's you and the few loved ones at 11 o'clock at night when you're licking envelopes and putting on stamps, and on Saturdays at 6 o'clock, on Sundays at 4 o'clock when you're out in that sun walking door to door. You know, all the important people that stand next to you and take the pictures, they're not there. It's the loved ones, the family members that are there to run a campaign. And luckily, and for a lot of people, I have a big family and a big extended family. Those were the ones that ran my campaign and, I mean, put in the hard work. Um, so it does. It takes a family. Whenever I talk to anybody running, whenever someone said they want to run, I say, how big is your family? How close is your family? Because you can't count on me. You can't count on Congressman X or Commissioner X. Yeah, we'll smile with you. We may even help you raise some money. But when it comes down to walking door to door, when it comes down to making those phone calls, to licking those envelopes, it takes you and your family to do it. Now, I remember... Um you know, those late, those late nights, licking envelopes, going out, putting out signs. Sign runs, late night sign those runs. Those were those bad <laughs> years, knocking on doors, um, having people saying, oh, that's my cousin. I'm like, I don't know you. Um, you know, where did you get all of that from? The, I, the, no one in our, in our family is a politician. Well, it, it actually, it started at Johnson C. Smith. So while I was in college, I um, pledged Alpha at Smith, and we decided um, that we need to get into student government. CAP was ran student government for years. And so the fraternity got together, and they said, okay, two of you are going to run for student government. It was me and number 10 from my line from Buffalo, Carlton Reddick. So we were on the board of trustees. And so my senior year, they said, okay, Chris, you're going to run for president. And I was running against a popular guy um, whose brother had been president, and he was on the cap line or whatever, and we knew to beat him, we had to get grassroots. We had to really get grassroots, and so I spent my time in front of Liston Hall, talking to people, going door to door in Liston Hall, and Barry Hall, Carter Hall, mm -hmm. going and talking to people. I tried to get into Greenfield, but they didn't trust me. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it, but I learned those tactics of I'm running against a popular guy from a popular family. I got to meet the people. I right. got to go guerrilla tactics and meet the people and get those votes. And so that's why I learned how to do the hard work for campaigning was running for student body president at Smith. Going door to door, going and meeting people, going out to the football games, going everywhere to, to meet with people and tell my story. Now, um, you, mentioned, you mentioned Smith, um, and not to veer too much away from it, but you are alpha man. Yes. Um, and how how... Did that come about? You know, you participating in, um, you know, in the fraternity. Well, when I was in high school, I um, was in a program called Alpha Men of Tomorrow in Fort Lauderdale, in which you get high school men, and all the fraternities have them. Um, the Qs have lamp lighters, Kappas have the um, Kappa League, Sigmas have a program, Alphas have Alpha Men of Tomorrow, which we met over about. 10 weeks, and each week was a different seminar. We met the different alphas and everything. They taught us different things about growing up, and then we had to write an essay at the end and actually wrote the best essay and got a scholarship from it. And so when I went to college, I was already thinking alpha because those are the men I met. Um, the problem is when I got to Smith, I'd had two uncles that had pledged Kappa at Smith, and so I was a little torn, but I, I, I thought about the men back home that I'm only at Smith for two years. I'm home for the rest of my life, and I want to associate with those men, those lawyers in Fort Lauderdale, those men that really helped me. And so I wound up pledging Alpha um, with a good, you know, with, with a good crew. 
It was right. 10 of us, very diverse and very non-alpha type line. And I think it was one of the best times of my life, one of the best things I did in my life. I developed a great network that I still use today. What helped you stand out in your, in your political career? Because, um, you know, you went from the representative uh, to the state senate, and you were also a democratic leader. I was a leader in the house, and I'm leader in the, I was a leader in the senate. How does that work? Hard work and being smart. It's it's it, being a lawyer helps um, when you're developing laws. It helps to understand laws, and so in the house, I really distinguished myself by being a lawyer and really being able to articulate well our arguments, being able to to really help people formulate other arguments and being able to help people in general. I mean, I, I travel the state campaigning with other members, helping other members raise money, do those things. So I was elected leader in the House. Then when I came to the Senate, I did the same things. I stood out in my arguments on the floor. I stood out in my way of working with others and getting stuff done that I became leader in the Senate. Now, it seems like you had a lot of success. Um, I want to talk about failures because a lot of people are you know, afraid to touch on that or don't know how to overcome. Uh, you know, is there any type of failure that you, that you experience in this journey? Um, it, it, it seems minor, but it taught me a lot. When I first got here, I ran for chair of the Black Caucus. Um, um, so all the black members, we have a group, and I wanted to be chair of that when I was in the House. And I lost that election, um, and I learned a lot because while running for chair, you know, I was I was saying, hey, when I'm chair, I'm firing all the staff. I'm changing this. I'm changing that. And yeah, I ain't win that. <laughs> and it taught me sometimes you can't come in saying you're gonna make all these wholesale changes. People people aren't used to like big changes at once. And so I kind of tipped my hand, and I lost that election. That really taught me people need gradual change. They need gradual change. And so, and sometimes you don't need to tip your hand at every time. And, and so that that loss for just a little position up here, you know, taught me a lot about future races and things that I want to do about tipping my hand on everything that I want to do. Um, and I mean, there's plenty of the failures growing up from athletics to romantically <laughs> to, a, to a whole lot of stuff. Um, but that, that's what makes you better. If You have to learn from failures. With the failures um, comes distractions on the other end. Were there any distractions? You know, what were, can you name any distractions in this journey um, going, you know, coming to be a Senate? Um, well, the distractions are always trying to be popular. Uh, too many politicians, I think, try to be popular, and that can be a distraction. Um, jumping on every issue at the beginning, that can be a distraction. Trying to get your name in the press, trying to get your face in the press. That could be a distraction. Too many times we you, you, you're tempted to jump on an issue as soon as it goes down. Okay, this just happened, so I'm going to be on the front line with this and be out there. Sometimes you need to sit back and wait and let things play out before you get out there. So there, there's a distraction of, of, of trying to be popular at all times. Sometimes it's good to just sit back, let things play out, and then be a leader and not just be popular. Okay. Um, and with that, I know that when we were walking in before you were showing me the, the lobbyists um, and how it started, um, you know, let's, let's, go, let's, go through some of, let's go through some of that. See, I like, I like to tell those stories here because I love the hi history of where we are. Well, right now we're in the Senate chamber. Uh, we're here. Uh, when we go into what's called session, that's for 60 days to pass all the bills and everything for the year. Uh, and we're here for 60 days on this floor. And on day 60, when it's time to stop, the sergeant of the Senate and the sergeant of the House walked out right there in the middle and they dropped their hankies signaling sign me die. What's called sign me die, that means all work stops. So if you got a bill that's been voted on in the Senate that haven't made it to the House or vice versa, whatever you're working on is dead. If it ain't passed, it's dead. Uh, the, the pictures around here, I know you were asking about that. Those are Senate presidents from the beginning to now. So everyone that's a Senate president um, gets their picture up here. Senate president is elected by the body. Um, and it's usually whatever majority party elects their president. So we've been in the minority for a while. So all these were Democrats until 
um, the, the woman with the red, the guy next to her, Jim Scott, he was the first Republican Senate president. That's when the Republicans took over. So everyone past him are Republican um, chairs. They're, they're presidents right now. And it's funny, Jim Scott, the first Republican president, was my first boss out of law school when I worked for Tripp Scott, Conklin, and Smith. Nice. Um, and so it, it, that's a funny connection that I was didn't even know I was going to be up here. And I worked for a Senate president at the, uh, right out of law school. But so we're here in the chamber. Um, right behind us is where the press sit. And people sit up here and watch us all day. I mean, it's an open, open process. Anyone can come in, sit down, and watch us as we do our work all, all day. Uh, right outside the doors is the lobby in between the House and the Senate. And that's where the term lobbyists came from. There are people that stand out there to influence us. So it used to be, before we had text messages and stuff, they'd send slips of paper in. So you get a slip of paper, they put it on your desk, it'll be, you know, somebody from this industry can step outside for a minute and they talk to you about this bill or this vote that's about to come up. Um, now they just text message you. Right. Um, and so you go outside and talk to the lobbyist about their issue, then you come back inside. The only people allowed on this floor are members and like special people um, that are designated by the president, but the public isn't allowed here. Other places like Louisiana, I think they can go on the floor, which is crazy. The public's allowed to sit up top and watch us, but only members are allowed on the floor. And I always remember uh, my last days in the house, I had uh, my um, grandfather, uh, John Willie Carter, was there. I had him on the floor with me, and he began to get teary-eyed. And then he said, um, you know, I was like, what's wrong? He's like, you know, I can't believe I'm sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives. I couldn't even sweep this floor growing up. I wasn't even able to sweep the floor in here, and I'm sitting here with my grandson, who's being honored as a leader in this chamber. And so I always think about that when I sit on this floor sometimes, you know, the history that, you know, I'm some little bastard child from Fort Lauderdale sitting on the Senate floor. And now when I stand up and hold that mic, everyone shuts up to hear what I got to say about an issue. That's, I mean, that's kind of special being here. Right. You're making me cry because um, you mentioned, you know, John Willie, which is my granddad. And um, one of the things that I love that you always bring the family back. And we're here. We, um, we support you in everything that you do. And it's, it's a really nice feeling to have this experience, you know? Right. Hello. Hello. Wow. I appreciate you, man. Honorable. Alright, everybody. This is the Honorable Benjamin <laughs> L. Crump. Hi, how are you? That's how my you cousin know? Carletta. Nice to meet you. Graduate of Johnson C. Smith University. North Carolina. Yes. I'm from Lumberton, North Carolina. Love it. <laughs> now I'm working um I'm working on a show. I started it two years ago. Okay. And it's called Beyond Revealed. Um, and I wanted to basically interview different individuals about their success and um, things that they are doing and how they're giving back to the community and things of that nature. So uh, I never had a chance to link up with Chris, so we came down here. And that's why I always tell people, you know, I'm a proud product of the 33311 and great things come out of the 33311. And you're a prime example, myself and, and Chris, you know, so... You know, I always tell people, listen, be careful and be mindful who you hang around. Exactly. You know, we, we hung around, we did things. We were typical kids and, you know, we got in some mischiefs. Oh, but... really? Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you a million other stories oh like that uh, in regards to uh, me and Chris. And... It was just great to see on Sistrunk Boulevard, all the police cars, all the press and everything just coming down in our little community. And Barack Obama gets out and shake my hand and everything, and it winds up in the Ebony magazine. It's in like the commemorative issue and everything. Essence magazine. It's in the commemorative issue and everything. So it's great meeting him um, two days before he became president. I think that's what keeps him grounded mm -hmm. because you know he knows where he came from, right. uh, the the challenges that he had. So he it keeps him anchored. Mm -hmm. It keeps the balance. Uh, he's successful which is great when you're in public service because then you stay connected to the people. Just so, do what it takes. Right now, people aren't willing to do what, I mean, I, I did any, I used to go wash Mr. Evans' car 
I was in law school. If you want this car wash, I was over there washing this car. Uh, I house set for him. I mean, what, whatever it took. And I think we've gotten away, generations have gotten away of doing whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to, to succeed. We sometimes get on our high horses and stuff like that. You got to be willing to work hard and just do anything. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Lake Middle School. Hi. I'm Senator Chris Smith from Fort Lauderdale. My Senate district is Fort Lauderdale and all the areas around there. I served in the House for eight years, and now I'm finishing up my eight years in the Senate. And so welcome to the state capitol.